everybody, and welcome to another episode of Cruising Israel, where Max and I are here to show you all the hidden treasures that Israel has to offer. And today is going to be a very special day, Max. We are going on a tour around Tel Aviv, but not any ordinary tour. Uh -huh. We're going on a vegan tour. Ooh, a vegan tour. Are you going to guess right. that? Did you know that Israel has the most amount of vegans per capita? I didn't know that that was a fact, but it makes sense. You do hear a lot about the vegan thing here yeah, in Tel Aviv. It's a pretty large vegan scene. So, we're gonna learn a little bit more about that today. Yeah, are you ready? Let's do it. Yeah. If you haven't already heard, Tel Aviv is among the top vegan friendly cities in the world, which is creating quite a buzz. Tourists tailing from all over the world are flocking to the vegan capital of Israel, just as the country has found itself in the midst of its own vegan revolution. Tel Aviv's vegan craze has been booming in recent years and shows no signs of slowing down, which is why today we met up with professional food tour guide, Evie, who's going to show us the best vegan eateries around our favorite city. So why don't you tell us what we could be expecting so okay. Tel Aviv is one of the top vegan uh, destinations in the world today. And we're going to try and give you a nice taste of why. We have some of the best restaurants, the best chefs, and the best dishes. And we're going to have an amazing culinary adventure. So veganism isn't just a diet, but rather a lifestyle. Am I right? Absolutely. Even by definition, being a vegan is not only abstaining from meat eating and chicken and fish. It's also not consuming any animal byproducts, no cosmetics, no riding on camels or horses or any of that. It's even up to a level that you can't go and visit a zoo or a circus. That is not somewhere you'll find a vegan. Most Mediterranean foods are plant-based, with hummus and falafel being among the staple of Israeli diet. Joining the vegan ranks in Israel is not as challenging as you may think. With 400 vegan-friendly restaurants, I promise you won't go hungry. We're entering now Meshek Barzilai in the entrance to Nevet Sedek neighborhood. A health food restaurant turned vegan. Lovely, let's check it out. For a restaurant that is based entirely on organic foods and puts an emphasis on hearty, wholesome dishes, Meshek Barzilai is the place. It is the center for foodies and can be enjoyed by vegans and non-vegans alike. קודם כל אנחנו משתמשים בחומרי גרם מחוטים ואורגנים. אנחנו משתמשים באמון ירקות, טופו, בסייטן, באמון סויה, באמון קיטניות, באמון ירקות. אנחנו מייצרים המבורגר מפטריות ועדשים מונבטות וטופו. Okay, I'm starving, so I'm digging in. Petavon, bon appetit. Um, I'm gonna start with this. The chef brought out a delicious eggplant and pepper terrine, stuffed with cheese and pesto, as well as a vegan cheese platter and a delicious veggie burger. That's for you. Mm. Wow, that is just packed with flavor. Amazing. Some people may think that vegan food is bland, but I think that's just a myth. Am I right? Absolutely. It could be exciting and full of flavors. The inventive menu at this vegan bistro was created with the goal of offering guests something unique and has led it to being one of the leading organic restaurants in the country. I have been here for about 14 years, and I haven't eaten for a long time. לא דגים, לא בשר, לא ביצים, וזה עניין של זמן. זה פתח לי עולם אה, רחב יותר, אה, מלא קטניות, שאנשים אה, שאוכלים בשר לא מכירים את העולם הזה. וזה המיוחד, שיש אה, מגוון רחב. So that was really tasty and enjoyable, but before we get too ahead of ourselves, um, I think we should move on to the next restaurant. Absolutely, this was delicious. I enjoyed every bite, and we have so much more ahead of us. Let's go. Mm -hmm. So, Evie, when did vegan culture emerge here in Tel Aviv? Well, it's been uh, around for decades and centuries, but in 2012, 
uh, Gary Urofsky visit, one of the biggest speakers of veganism in the world, uh, really caused a real uh, burst of uh, vegan culture. Really? Yes. Okay. And it became from a trend to a real lifestyle. Wow. Today we're going to talk about the world's forgotten victims, animals. Yurovsky's eye-opening lecture spread virally, with a million Israelis tuning in. Shortly after, veganism went mainstream, and now signs of the revolution are ubiquitous. Also on top of that, 12 to 15 percent uh, of Israelis are vegetarians. So together, 15 to 20 percent, that's one out of five to one out of six Israelis is a vegan or a vegetarian. That is huge. That's like about double the world average. So we're definitely world leaders, and we can also see it translate into number of businesses that are vegan. Uh, vegan businesses could be not only restaurants, but caterings, hairdressers, hotels, even a tour could be a vegan tour. And there are 700 registered businesses as vegan friendly uh, in all of Israel, around half of that only in Tel Aviv. So this is definitely a vegan capital and a place that attracts and uh, shows the possibility in veganism in its most beautiful, pure way. We're entering now Nanuchka, the first 100% Georgian vegan restaurant in the world. Wow, impressive. Yes, very delicious. Actually, it's outstanding because Georgian cuisine is typically not vegan, mm -hmm. but they made the change here and it is amazing. Yes, Georgian cuisine and culture is all about good food, good drinks, and hospitality, and good music, and being together. So, it should be exciting and fun. Absolutely. Let's go. Nanushka offers a multi-sensual experience. By night, the restaurant transforms into a fun night out accompanied by belly dancers and music. These are typical Georgian dishes. This is pchali, which is an assortment of different salads. And we have amazing uh, stuffed vine leaves, um, badrijani, which is an eggplant uh, delight. And here we have kinkali, which are the Georgian stuffed uh, dumplings with, uh, with mushrooms and truffles. For sure, knowledgeable Georgian cuisine. Well, I love this place. It's delicious. It's a multi-sensual experience. The music, the atmosphere. Everything about this place is delightful. So I know that the walnut is the king of the kitchen, the Georgian kitchen. Yes. So here's the crushed walnuts mm -hmm. mixed with uh, Also with uh, eggplant, yeah, different herbs. The restaurant wasn't vegan when it launched, until one day they decided to remove all the animal-based products from the menu and transform them into vegan delights. We don't be vegan all the time. We change uh, uh, before four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we, before we eat and sell a lot of uh, meat, mm -hmm. but we decide. I decide to do the change because I think it's the better if you can eat so many food, delicious and mm -hmm. good and healthy, and you don't need to kill anybody to eat it. Mm -hmm. So this next place that we're going to is a Persian vegan restaurant, right? Yeah, it's super interesting. It's run by a Persian family and it's really innovative. The dishes here are some of the best you will ever have in the vegan culinary world. Wow. Just keeps getting better and better, huh? Yep. Now, some say this vegan restaurant is the best in town. The Persian-influenced dishes are prepared with the freshest and highest of quality ingredients. Cheers to that. Bechaim. On my tour, wow. we enjoy a chaser arc in the beginning of, or the end as an aperitif or a digestive. That is so sweet. Oh. <laughs> the ecological inspired interior design consists of second hand everything from the furniture to the dishes and even the carpet stapled to the roof. אנחנו הראשונים, בין הראשונים שפתחנו, והמיוחד אצלנו, שאצלנו הכל מהשורש, לא מכניסים אוכל מעובד, הכל פה מאבדים פה, כל האוכל ירקות, רק ירק. The vision of the head chef was to appeal to a non-vegan crowd by focusing on the ingredients rather than just finding alternatives to meat. 
We started out with the caprese salad with vegan ricotta and fresh veggies. As delicious as that was, the cauliflower gundi took it to a whole other level. The traditional Persian dish is a soup that consists of meatballs and chickpea flour, but the chef included his own personal spin on it by grinding cauliflower, chickpeas, and other veggies. So this vegan movement is growing and growing. Do you think it's just a phase or, or it's here to stay? Well, the numbers are rise, rising all the time. Mm -hmm. So is awareness and you know sharing information and activism. Uh, it's definitely a way of life today. It's not a trend anymore. Between 2 to 5% of Israelis consider themselves as vegans. That equals to 1 out of 20 to 50 people. Sounds like a lot, right? And now even those doing their mandatory IDF service can keep true to their vegan lifestyle, with the IDF offering vegan meals and is even issuing leather-free combat boots. Cheers! Rechaim. Vegan cocktails! After enjoying the last meal, I asked Evie to take us to one last place. And I know you're probably thinking, how is it possible to eat any more? But I do need to satisfy my sweet tooth. So we're now at Jella, the first 100% vegan ice cream place in Israel. We're gonna have some soy almond milk based ice creams. What do you recommend? Snickers? You need to do what you usually do. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Jella offers 18 flavors of almond-based ice cream. It looks just like real ice cream. Can't even tell the difference. Very authentic looking. Even with the flavor. Nice tasting. Yeah. I love their flavors. They're so amazing. Mm. <laughs> wow. Really enjoying that, huh? Yeah, tasty. Whoa, yum. I like mine better, though. I like mine better. <laughs> great. Well, I had a great time exploring the city with you in the vegan capital of the world. And this is just a little taste of what Tel Aviv has to offer, all right? Absolutely. And the purpose of the tour as you kind of sensed, it was not to convince anybody to become a vegan, but it is to show the possibility and the abundance and really amazing life, vegan lifestyle we have here. We really want you to take one thing from here today, and if we could give you a message to take, would be if we all make a small little change in each other, uh, in ourselves, in global aspect, it will be huge. We're going to make together the world a better place. Wow, I like how you said that. So although Israel is indeed the land of milk and honey, many choose to make it an almond milk and date honey. I don't know about you, Max, but I had a really great time looking and exploring around Tel Aviv and the different vegan restaurants. Yeah. It's really now, how about a place in the foothills of Jerusalem where okay. they have artifacts that can show you different parts of history through time? Of course, I'm always willing to listen to some historical facts, Max. Well, they've got a pretty unique collection, I heard, so let's see what it's all about. We all grew up listening to tales from our grandparents. After all, who makes a better storyteller than them, right? Not only listening to stories, but to see them come to life through interacting with thousands of collectible items dating back decades, each telling its own unique story about life in a simpler time. In the hills of Jerusalem is Saba's Little Museum, where Safta Debi and Saba Yaakov spent years together collecting all sorts of memorabilia. We are now surrounded by all these ancient artifacts and collectibles, probably thousands and thousands of pieces around us. Um, how did you manage to collect all this? Uh, firstly, we like to collect things. Uh -huh. We have very sharp eyes, so we make sure it doesn't belong to anybody, first of all, and we take some things. And people know that we collect. They don't have where to, um, to keep their things. Mm -hmm. And they say, I can't throw this out. I want to know where it's going to be. And they give it to us. Another man's trash is another man's treasure, right? Safta Debi and Saba Yaakov both share a passion for collectibles ever since they can remember. It all began from childhood as their parents passed down their own collectibles as well. And their grandparents always had 
fossils in the house, um, different antiquities as well, coins, etc., etc. And then we started collecting more and more, and people heard about us. Would you look at this weapon? This dates back all the way to Napoleon's time, and it was found right here on the Moshav. That's right. Would you tell us about it a little bit? We'll put it down now. All okay. right. Two, three. It is heavy. Yeah. The rifle was found here on the Moshav uh, by my late father-in-law who founded the Moshav and was in charge of the local security. He used to do, uh, he used to walk around and check the hills to make sure no infiltrators were trying to get into the Moshav in the early 1950s. This is a Napoleonic rifle. It belonged to, the, to Napoleon's army. His army did get as far as Akko. They wanted to get to Jerusalem to conquer the Holy Land. Unlike the rifle, Napoleon never ended up stepping foot onto the Holy Land. Sapa's Little Museum also showcases many other items relating to Israeli defense forces as well. This dagger was used by the special unit that was in the Palmach that Jews who looked Aryan were enlisted to a special unit, the idea being that if indeed the Nazi threat of coming to, is to Palestine, to conquer Palestine and annihilate all the Jews, if they were to come here, then this particular unit would be, um, would be disguised as germ, as part of the German army, and they would work from inside to, uh, to get rid of the local Germans who were trying to get through. Mm -hmm. The dagger has a Nazi emblem on its surface with a German inscription, everything is for Germany. The museum is situated in a small moshav just a few miles away from the big city of Jerusalem and overlooks a breathtaking view. However, when the moshav was founded in the early 1950s by Holocaust survivors, the view was more beneficial than its mere beauty, but for strategic importance, as you can see cities like Modin, Ashkelon, and Ashdod. So is there anything here that holds significance to you? I think so. I think so. It's to do with my own family. Mm -hmm. And let's come, I'll show you. Is of my grandparents. They were married in Tel Aviv in, uh, 92 years ago. Mm -hmm. My grandmother had fled prior to the mandate, just before the mandate, 1917, from the Russian Revolution in Minsk. She came to Palestine with the, with the clothes on her back but also with somebody else, with Herzl, who was already a very important personality. Theodor Herzl was the visionary behind Zionism. He formed the World Zionist Organization and promoted Jewish migration in an effort to form a Jewish state. He was a prominent personality all over the world. This tapestry can be found everywhere. Uh, we're fortunate to still have ours, a picture of Herzl as though he's in Basel. But he isn't looking at Basel, he's looking at what do we see here? We see here the old city, the Tower of David. We see here the Sun of Liberty. And also further down, we see the masses of Jews returning to Zion. So the stories told at Saba's Little Museum are endless and is a must see for anyone who's truly enthusiastic about history. Every artifact has its own story and we help tell that stories. And we invite our guests to share their stories with us and then they become part of the chain of the storytelling and enriching others. Max, have you ever left Israel since you moved here? Yeah, I've done a little bit of traveling. There's a lot of places I haven't been to. Why? Well, of course, but have you ever been to Spain? No, but I've heard really good things about it. Oh, about the yes. The food, the drinks, why? Well, what if I told you that we don't even have to leave the borders of Israel to enjoy some Spanish culture and cuisine? Wow, that sounds great. Somewhere right here in town? In the center of Tel Aviv, we'll enjoy some tapas and gin and really good. Let's not wait any longer. Let's go do it. Let's go, Max. we've taken you to many restaurants that you may not expect to be here in Israel and tonight is no different. We're going to Cerveceria to enjoy some Spanish cuisine. On one of the busiest streets in Tel Aviv buzzing with all kinds of bars and a thriving nightlife is a lively bar and restaurant serving some savory tapas. It smells awesome. 
Tapas are small in size but huge in flavor, and with a pretty large variety, customers enjoy the many different flavors of Spain. Considering Spain is the world's largest gin consumer, it's no surprise restaurant Cerveceria has a wide selection of the spirit coming from all around the world. Um, how about Max and I have some sangria and some gin? Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Spanish culture, it's like gathering all together after work, between work and everything with a bunch of uh, people and uh, talk, eat, eat good uh, food and just to enjoy. The Spanish people know to enjoy life and uh, this is what we're trying to do over here. It was then time to decide what to order. There's just so much on the menu, I think I should yeah, leave it to you. So you know what, I trust you, but I heard that they, this restaurant has the best churros in town. So we you have did. to bring that. I will. <laughs> Spain is known for its colorful cocktails and is an important part of its social culture. So let's see what the bartender has to offer. Hi, what are you going to drink? So I did my homework before coming in this place and I think the Cerveceria Gimlet is the way to go. Sure. Yeah? Sounds great. Now I'll put some gin in it. This is Saint Germain liquor. It's kind of sweet. Fresh taste from the cucumbers. Yeah. I can see why this is the Israeli favorite. Yeah. The food then slowly started coming out, and it was time to treat our taste buds. Over here, you have uh, fish total, okay. which is today uh, albacore. This is our endive salad. This is uh, the confit with the uh, orange sauce. It all looks phenomenal, colorful, fresh, and tasty. I love tapas food. It's just a more fun way to eat. Yeah. So sharing is caring. <laughs> yeah. So let's <laughs> dig in. Good stuff. You're gonna bring those churros, right? Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Saving the best for last. This is not so easy to find in Israel, but. Cervesteria was inspired by the bars on the streets of Madrid, and with the owner's love of Spain, it quickly became an Israeli favorite. We do uh, try to, to bring them the happiness. So we do it uh, by the music, by the food, uh, by the people that walk in the walk scene. Well, that's it for us this week, folks. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Cruising Israel. We're so happy to have you with us. And don't forget to catch us next time as we cruise the country and show you the best Israel has to offer. Bye.